I want to talk to you this evening about something that is important because whatever becomes familiar can end up becoming hidden in your life. That if you don't know that something is there, it may have been there the whole time and you never noticed it. Last week, I had the privilege of speaking at a conference with a girl that, that uh, will be here soon enough, but, but she, was, she was telling me about how that they had gotten messed up religiously when they were younger. Her parents ended up getting into a cult that really just kind of turned into kind of a, a sexual fiasco, and her parents were kind of caught in it, and it was a pretty rough deal of the things that they had gone through, but because they wanted to please God as much as they did, it actually took them 23 years for them to recognize it. Now, the term cult is an interesting thing because the term cult only means that you love something more than someone else does. You love what someone else hates. Britney Spears has a cult. You may be in Justin Bieber's cult. Lord help you because he spent some time over, overseas with Lionel Richie's daughter and now him and Selena are just off forever. So you just, uh, you just have to figure all of this out, how, how all of this is happening. And so um, there goes their Christianity all over again. It just kind of like, it just blows up. But there was something that she said that was so important and it remains true for us tonight, and that is that she recognized it when she was 23, that the Holy Spirit never left her. Because many times you can think that he does. You can think he's not there. You can become so frustrated about situations and circumstances and wonderment why that things have not worked out the way that you want them to work out or the way that you felt that they should or why are they taking as long as they are and why is it that I seem like I'm playing football every day trying to figure out how to get through these avenues of life. But the Holy Spirit was there all the time. In the book of John chapter 20, verse number 22 in the Message Bible, it says this. It says, then he took a deep breath and breathed into them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. He said, but who is the Holy Spirit? Who is he? Number one, the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Trinity. Now let's kind of talk about that for a moment because most of us in this room are Trinitarians. If you were to go over to the Pentecostal church, they would be oneness people. These oneness individuals only believe that, you know, there's three, there, there's just one, not three. There's not three gods, but there's one God. And however you look at that isn't really, isn't really, let's just say it doesn't have a lot of consequence. The way that religion is looked at, truthfully, has little consequence. Whether or not that you believe that you can do this or you can't do this, this is of little consequence. The only consequence that there is really is whether or not that you understand tr from the depth of your heart that the only redemption that there is is through admission that you need a redeemer. And that that redemption, and when he redeems you, he sets you free. It doesn't become a thing of that I can do this or I can't do that or that this is right or that this is wrong. None of that becomes a real issue. It becomes listening to the one who did redeem you. And so here is seeing, and this is the reason why that I am personally a Trinitarian. This is the reason why I am. Now, do I think that you need to be a Trinitarian to be saved? No, but you do need to believe that Jesus died for the sins of mankind to be saved. But do you need to be a Trinitarian? Not necessarily. Now, I'm over some of your heads already. You think, well, my goodness, I th isn't everybody a Trinitarian? No, not everyone likes French fries either. But in the book of Matthew... Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse number 13, the Bible says this to us. 
Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. That was really a no-no. And so here, John didn't want to baptize him. He said, I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, it must be done. Because we must do everything that is right. We need to do the right thing. Say, I need to do the right things. Then John said these words. He said, so John then baptized him. But after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were open. Now, here we go, Jesus being one. The heavens were opened and he saw the Spirit of God, that being two, descending on him like uh, and settling on him. And a voice came from heaven and said, that's three. Jesus was there. The Spirit came on him and descended, and then a voice spoke from heaven. So the voice was not the, the thing that was descending, because it didn't say, I heard a descending voice that came and sat upon nothing. But there was Jesus, there was the Spirit descending upon him, and there was the voice that came from heaven which said, this is my beloved Son, and I'm fully pleased with him. Number two, the Holy Ghost is a person. He's a person. He can be disappointed. He can be disappointed. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse number 29, he said, don't use foul or abusive language. He said, let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. May God help all of us that every word that we speak is always helpful to every person that we speak to. Verse 30, and he said, and do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. That ought to tell you a lot of things right there. It's not how I get to live. It's how you want me to live. Well, yeah, but this is what I want to do. Doesn't God want me to do what I want to do? I'm not so sure. Because I figured out what I want to do just isn't kind of like the best thing, no matter how great of intentions that I have. Depending upon which time it is during the day, it will kind of determine my level of commitment to doing the right things in life. You're no different. Why are you looking at me that way? And don't bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. Remember, he is the one who has identified you as his own, guaranteeing that you will be saved upon the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit can also be lied to, so he can be disappointed. But he can also be lied to. In the book of Acts chapter 5, beginning with verse number 1, in the Message Bible it tells us, but a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, not Sapphire, but Sapphira, his wife, Sapphira, see, people always want into everything, don't they? Her name was not Sapphire, it's Sapphira, conniving in with him. So Sapphira actually was conniving with her husband, Ananias. They actually sold a piece of land but they secretly kept back part of the price for themselves and then brought the rest to the apostles and made an offering of it. Now, I kind of wondered, like, what was the big deal about all of this? And simply, it was just the fact that they lied about it. It wasn't the fact they could have kept back anything that they wanted to. They didn't have to give any of it, actually. They didn't have to give... I mean, I'm, I'm sure that they, they tithed, but at the same time, what they did was that they kind of let everyone know that, what they, should, that they, what they were going to do was they were actually going to give it all. They wanted to mirror this fellow that looked like he was really taking off whose name was Barnabas. Oh, but by the way, his name wasn't Barnabas, but he got named Barnabas because of how much of a blessing that he truly was. He gave lands that he had. He sold them, gave all the money, 
And they were so encouraged by that, they called him the son of encouragement. So they wanted to be looked at just like he was, except for they wanted some of the money just as well. But maybe they could have used it in order to pay off their credit cards. But there, what happened was, Peter said, Ananias, how did Satan get you to lie to the Holy Spirit and secretly keep back part of the price of the field before you sold it? He said, before you sold it, it was all yours. He said, and after you sold it, the money was yours to do with as you wished. So what got you or what got into you to pull a trick like this? You didn't lie to men, but you actually lied to God. Now that's interesting. The Holy Spirit can be lied to. But not only can he be disappointed, not only can he be lied to, but he can actually also be insulted. You think, oh man, the Holy Spirit, ain't got I mean, he's just, he can be insulted. In the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 29, the Bible tells us this. In the God's Word translation, he says, what do you think a person who shows no respect, shows no respect, What do you think a person who shows no respect for the Son of God deserves? Well, you know, God loves them. He just asked you, what do you think a person that shows no respect for the Son of God, what do they deserve? Can't you see how different God's loyalties are than human beings? When God's into you, man, he's into 100% of you. He's not into my compromises. He's into me. He's not into saying, hey, don't worry about it. He's saying, I'm giving you all that I am, and you have every one of my resources at your disposal. So now walk it out, pal, because it's all yours. You can do it. Well, yeah, but it's just so hard. He didn't say it wasn't hard. He just said they're all yours. So he said, what do you think that a person who shows no respect for the Son of God deserves? That person looks at the blood of the promise, the blood that made him holy as no different from other people's blood, and he insults the spirit that God gave us out of his kindness. He deserves a much worse punishment. Then the third thing that we find out is that we find out that the Holy Spirit knows the past, the present, and the future. Know this about God, Jesus Christ. If you remember in the book of Hebrews, chapter 13, verse number 8, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is the same when? Yesterday, when? And and then? So understand this. He is omniscient, which means that he's all-knowing. The ultimate smarty pants. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. He's all-powerful. A set of scriptures I didn't read to you this morning was in Job chapter 40. Here it was that Job actually was at a place where he had now begun to complain to God and begin to say that he knew everything and that he couldn't figure out what was going on. And finally, God speaks back to him. And when God finally speaks back to him, Job finally says this. He says, now I put my hand over my mouth. I can say nothing to you. You know all of this. You know everything. You are not only omniscient, but you're omnipotent because he said, do you speak? He said, Job, when you speak, can you speak like it is thunder? Job said, nah, <laughs> can't do that. And so here we find out that the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He knows everything. So if you want to find something out, he'll tell you. Because he knows everything. He's all powerful. If you need something changed, he can change that. And then he's omnipresent, which just means that he's everywhere at all times. Now this is different than demons. Demons are finite. They're not infinite. 
Demons actually can only be at one place at one time. That's the reason why that there are times during the day when you can go through a difficult time and you can look back a couple hours later and you think, what in the world just happened to me? Because they were there and then a couple hours later they were completely gone. Why? Because demons aren't everywhere at once. They have to go somewhere else. They've got somebody else to mess up their life. You're not the only person that they want to mess up. There's other people. They got to pull double duty. We're getting stronger. Amen. They've got to start really pushing, putting the pedal to the metal on this stuff. Time's getting short. And they're losing. Amen. We're not going, oh, Jesus, come back. I just want to get out of here. No, you know the reason why that I want him to come back? I want him to come back so that he can have everything that's his. Yeah, but don't come back until I get married. Well, yeah, then you'll want him to come back. It's It's just all of a sudden, like, you'll get this revelation, like, glory to God, Jesus is coming back. He's just coming back. (laughs) So then what's the Holy Spirit's function in our lives? He's our comforter. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse number 3, the Bible says, All praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the source of every mercy and the God who comforts us. He comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort others. Say, thank you, Jesus, for living your life through me by your spirit that I can comfort others. He said when others are troubled, we we can comfort them. We'll be able to give them the same comfort that God has given to us. In John chapter 14, verse number 16, Jesus said, and I will ask the Father. I'll ask the Father for you. I will ask the Father and he'll give you another counselor. We'll never leave you. He said he would never leave you. Then why do I feel so alone? He said he would never leave you. Because sometimes we think he's not there. And he was there all the time. And that little girl told me the other day that even through all of the things of her walking away from God and just saying how that it wasn't really true, it wasn't really real because of everything that they as a family went through. She said, you know, I never bought into that guy. That the Holy Spirit was there all the time. Is that we can sometimes think that he's not there. Say thank you you. for being there all the time. time. Just relax. Just let some stress out of the valve. Take it easy. It's going to be okay. You're going to be all right. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. My admission of needing him is my first step to recovery. Until I admit I need him, I can't recover. The second thing about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is our prayer partner. In Romans chapter 8, verse number 26, it says, And the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress. Distress, that's big. He said the Holy Spirit helps us in our distress. For we don't even know what we should pray for, nor how we should pray. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all the hearts, he knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony. Say, the Holy Spirit Spirit pleads for me 
in harmony with God's will. One of the important things about praying in the Spirit is realizing that he actually is pleading with God in harmony with God's will for you and for yours and for the situations that you face. So prayer in the Spirit is much more important than prayer in English. Prayer in the Spirit is much more important than in prayer that you can understand the words. There is a very, very well-known man whose name is Dr. Frederick Price. How many of you know Fred Price? You know Fred? Okay, well, you're a dying breed. But the, 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 that breed is leaving. But the thing that you need to know about Fred Price is that he says, he says that he has never prayed a prayer in English. He does not pray in English. He prays in the Spirit all the time. He said, if I ever got a prayer answered, I got, a pray, I got my prayers answered in other tongues. I got it done that way. And he says, and the Father who knows, verse 27, and the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony, harmony with God's own will. The third thing we need to know is that the Holy Spirit is our teacher. Say, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is, the is the master teacher. He is my teacher. He is my teacher. John chapter 14, verse number 26, the Bible tells us, but when the Father sends the counselor as my representative. He said, as he sends him as my representative, he said, and by the counselor, I mean the Holy Spirit. He will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I myself have told you. He'll remind you. Say, thank God for reminding me. Because some people I know, truthfully, they get, they get spiritual dementia. They forget. They walked at one level during many years of their life. And they begin to forget. You know, it's not how well you fly a plane, right? It's how you what? You got to land this dude. So flying, I could have a little bit of trouble flying because I'm coasting real well. But the thing that I can't do is I can't fake it on the landing. So as you prepare for your landing, just make sure you double up because you can't run out of gas before you land. And so here we find that he's going to teach us everything. He says he's going to remind us of everything that he has told us. Number four is that the Holy Spirit gives us instruction. He gives us our instructions. I'm grateful for instructions. I love being told what to do. I love it. I love it. In the book of Acts chapter 13, we know that it's the story of the prophets and the teachers coming together. And it was the birthplace of the, we'll just say the cor coronative, um, if that's a word, which it may not be, but I like it anyway. <laughs> but the coronation place, how's that? The coronation place of where Barnabas and Saul, who now became Paul at this place, that they actually had their ministry come into fruition. And so in verse number two here in Acts chapter 13, the Bible says, In one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work that I have for them. And then lastly, the Holy Spirit leads us. The Holy Spirit is going to lead you. And he's going to guide you. Say, thank you, Lord Jesus, for the Holy Spirit leading me and guiding me in all the places you want me to go. In Romans chapter 8, verse number 14, the Bible says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God 
of the children of God. Say, I am led by the Spirit of God, for I am a child of God. Say, I am led by the Spirit of God, for I am a child of God. Say, I am led by the Spirit of God, because I am a child of God. In John chapter 16, verse number 13, the Bible tells us this, and I'll close. He said, when the Spirit of truth comes, He'll guide you into all the truth. Hallelujah. Say, thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord for, guiding for guiding me into all the truth. He's going to guide you into all the truth. He's not going to be presenting his own ideas. He'll be telling you what he has heard from me. He's going to tell you about the future. So tonight, what our prayer together is, is that I want us to pray and agree together that you know the next step that you need to take. There's no more confusion. There's no more wondering. But that you know the step you need to take. No more worry. No more fear about what you need to do. He's going to show you the step that you need to take. Let's all stand together. Let's raise our hands and say this after me. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit I, want to thank you I want to thank you for being in my life, in my life. even when I did not acknowledge you. Thank you, Spirit of God, for being so kind to me, so kind to me. even during the moments, during the moments when, I when I was not kind to you. Help me, Help me. to become everything you've called me to become. Show me, me. from this moment forward, forward. my next step. step. Show me, me. by what the Word of God has to say, say. that sure step step. and that sure direction direction of my life. life. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Spirit. I acknowledge you, that you are with me, that you are are near me, that you you walk alongside me. In every area of my life. In In Jesus' name. name. Many times life can put a shell around us that makes us hard. We're no longer spontaneous to God's Spirit. And what's important is that He wants to lead you to people. To minister to. Because otherwise, if you don't allow him to lead you to minister to people, what good have you and I become any more than the Jews? We're here in this earth with a purpose. We're actually here with his dream. God has a dream. His dream is to have the whole world follow him. The whole world to bow before him. The whole world to actually receive the redemption. Do you know God always feels responsible? He even feels responsible for what you and I go through. Because if Adam would have done the right thing, you and I might have been able to spend our time just serving him in the garden, taking care of his trees, walking down his streets, talking about him in all of eternity without the memories.
without the discouragement and the disappointment, without lying, mostly to ourselves, not even really to someone else. That's the reason why the softness of heart is so important to us. Tenderness before God. Allowing Him to lead us and guide us. Why don't you be seated for just another minute?